here's how you can use the combat systems in Rise of the Ronin to go from noob to expert. We'll be looking at key, combat styles, stealth, and more, and we'll have some bonus tips for you at the end. And I've put chapter markers in the description so you can skip around as needed. To begin with, you might be asking, what is Rise of the Ronin? Well, I'm sponsored by PlayStation UK today to explain exactly that. Rise of the Ronin is an action-adventure game made by Team Ninja, and in it, you journey across 19th century Japan, recruiting allies from the world as you progress through the story. The game has varying levels of difficulty, so you can adjust it to suit your playstyle, and that means you can get really immersed in a world that is super accessible, but you will still need to watch out for all of the swords. Yeah, there are a lot of swords. So let's talk about the basics of the combat system to make those swords less of an issue. And then we'll showcase how you can go from noob to master. To begin with, this blue meter next to your health bar and enemy health bars indicates key level. Attacking spends key, but it also does key damage to enemies, which they will regenerate if you let them rest by not landing further attacks. And you'll regenerate if they don't attack you. Blocking reduces key recovery speed. So you're gonna want to stop blocking when you have a moment to spare. And if you get low on key or you run out entirely and then you get hit by an attack, you become panicked and unable to move, leaving you open for a critical strike from the enemy. This means you'll need to pay attention to your key bar and make sure not to get too carried away with attacking until you run out of key and leave yourself exposed and at risk of becoming panicked. To regenerate key, you can land successful counter sparks or parries against enemy attacks, and that will also lower the attacker's key at the same time. But there's an even easier way than counter sparking to generate key. So if you take a look at this yellow bar on your blades icon, when it's filled up, you can press R1 immediately after you attack to replenish your key. And this is called a blade flash. Now, one thing to be super aware of is you can't just do regular blocks for every attack. So sometimes you'll see an enemy is going to charge at you with a red attack. And that means they're using a martial skill and they cannot be regularly blocked. However, if you time it correctly, they can be countersparked. So you need to time your counterspark with this red flash to successfully parry. And countersparking in this way deals massive key damage to enemies and opens them up to critical strikes as well. There are four types of combat styles. Three of the styles, Jin, Chi, and Ten, are all strong and weak against certain weapon types. Thankfully though, you don't need to memorize which combat style is best for which situation, because like I said before, this game's really accessible, right? And it does a bit of the work for you here and simply shows you an icon above enemy heads, which distinguishes the effectiveness of your equipped combat style so that you always know where you stand with a given enemy, which is really nice. And there's that fourth combat style too. And this one's special because unlike the others, it's weak against all weapon types, but it has a devastating selection of martial skills, which you can then use on opponents. So martial skills are activated by holding R1 before attacking. And to switch styles during combat, you hold hold R1 and move the right stick to select. And here you can see the same icons that appear above enemies, but these tell you which style is most effective against the enemy you're locked onto. And you can unlock new combat styles by defeating fugitives, progressing the story, and forging bonds with characters throughout the world. Those are the people that I mentioned earlier who you might become allies with as you explore Japan. Now, combat styles upgrade in different ways, and to differentiate between them, go to the combat style page just here and hit square on the style that you're inspecting. Some require increasing bond level with characters, characters, others might be requiring you to progress the story further, things like that. Now, to increase your bond with allies, you can give them gifts labeled with a heart icon, and you can maximize your bond by offering multiple of a single gift, since there's a cooldown between when you can give gifts to that ally again. And you can also purchase gifts with silver at apothecaries, but make sure to purchase from ones with bond discounts to save a bit of silver when you do this. So that's the beginner level sandbox, right? That's the foundation of what all the other fun systems build on top of. And so there's the main things that a noob is going to be focusing on day to day in terms of approaching different combat encounters. But now let's talk about some more advanced combat techniques where some of your skill is going to be able to shine through, especially if you want to crank that difficulty up. So let's talk about sub-weapons for a second. Sub-weapons are generally good for range, while your blades or your primary weapons are effective for close-range combat. And one sub-weapon, shurikens, can be strategically used to keep an enemy's key level from regenerating while you're at range. And normally you wouldn't be able to hit them with your sword in that moment, but the shurikens can still reach them. Other sub-weapons include these earthenware balls, which you can throw at enemies to distract them and maintain your stealth if you're creeping around. And other sub-weapons include a fire pipe, aka 
a traditional flamethrower, a bow and arrow, rifles, revolvers, there's a whole selection to choose from. And speaking of whole selections, there's a whole selection of possible approaches to combat that you can take as well. So you have the option to stealth your way through missions, or you can just run straight into battle. And while it's tempting to just go guns blazing, I think learning to be really good in stealth is super valuable because you'll be able to assassinate enemies from behind, landing big critical strikes and taking them off guard. And this is especially valuable with the rapid assassinations skill unlocked from the dex tree. So there's a pro tip on that. Now, when you're trying to assassinate enemies, you've got options for how you want to do that. You can do it from above with the grappling rope, from behind while crouch walking, from above while dropping onto the enemy, for example, if you're gliding onto them. And my personal favorite is the full sprint assassination, which you unlock after upgrading the assassination tree in the dexterity tab. So that's great, right? Ways to kill enemies, fantastic. But some missions in the game will give you bonuses if you actually don't kill enemies. And you can do that by going to the Apothecary Trader in the Sakura Inn and purchasing wooden weapons in order to be a pacifist. Now, this is probably a good little segue to talk about missions a little bit. So the main story missions give you the option to bring a crew of allies along and you can swap between allies at any point in those missions. And also, you don't need to worry if you die or your ally dies in the mission either. It won't end the mission, don't worry. Instead, it just leaves them down on the ground to be revived. Now, allies are only going to utilize one combat style, so they might be weak against one enemy when another might be a better option. And a pro tip for how you can make best use of the ally system is when your character gets hit by a critical strike, you're going to get locked into an animation. But to maximize your damage output, you can quickly swap to an ally when this happens and then keep those attacks going. And similarly, if your key is running low, swap to your ally, keep the attacks going on them, and then you can swap back afterwards. Now, alongside all that stuff, there are actually five status ailments in the game as well, which you're going to need to be mindful of. They're burn, poison, paralysis, flammable and dizzy. I'll show you on screen now what each of those do. They all have their own kind of unique traits. And to apply these to enemies, there are elemental whetstones in the game that you can craft and apply to your primary weapons. And that will imbue the primary weapon with an element that inflicts one of the different status ailments. Now, similar to those whetstones and the different status ailments that we can apply, there are other things that also affect how our blade works just in general. And one of those is your blade origin. So your blade origin is going to benefit from a specific weapon type. But even so, I'd say it's still a good idea to use more than one weapon type. And part of the reason for this is that increasing your weapon proficiency levels for each type is going to give you different options as you progress. And you may end up finding a weapon that you really like using. So keep that in mind. Also, higher level items are more important than player level when tackling some of the harder content in the game. So keep that in mind as your sort of priority. And there are also gear set bonuses in the game, but they are not as important as, for example, just choosing a higher level item. So keep that in mind as you play as well. So let's do a little comparison of what your strategy might be and your approach might be if you're playing on Dawn, that's the easy difficulty, versus some pro-level expert strats for playing on Twilight, the hardest difficulty. To showcase this, I ran this mission on both difficulties, the first being on Dawn. And on Dawn, I felt I had pretty much complete freedom to choose my playstyle here, whether I wanted to use all the combat systems the game has to offer, or just to brute force my way through. Like I could do what felt like it suited me best. And so I chose to mostly just run right at enemies and pick fights head on, demolishing them all pretty much without using all those techniques that are available to me. And then there's a boss in the mission as well. And my noob strategy was just to basically corner him and take him out without even really needing to switch characters. But that was Dawn, right? Now let's move to Twilight and let's show off a little bit with some of the other fun things that we can do in the combat system. So on Twilight, I would make sure you utilize your detector as often as you possibly can. That's going to help you see enemy locations. And I'd say opting for stealth is more advised since enemies are now obviously going to be a lot more difficult and using stealth lets you assassinate them quickly without noticing you and getting in your way. Now, I also noticed when I was on Twilight that at times I might miss counter sparks and that would leave me open to enemy attacks. And this is when, like I said before, you should be switching to your ally to make sure that your damage output is maintained and you're not just left waiting and vulnerable while the enemy attacks you. Now, another thing I was aware of is that this strong guy here gave me a little bit of trouble the first time around. So in Twilight mode, I decided to take out some of the other enemies in the area before beginning this fight. And that way I could just tunnel vision a little bit more on what I needed to do. And this is just generally a smart move for prioritizing people in your combat encounters that are gonna make your life more difficult. So 
So even if there are just some weaker enemies on the side that might individually not do that much damage, it might be that they should still be your highest priority just so that once they're cleared, you're then able to focus a little bit more on the bigger task at hand. Now, once I got to the boss fight here, I was humbled pretty fast. I was pretty surprised by the level of challenge that the game was throwing at me here. And I failed this a bunch of times. I'm gonna be straight up with you guys. This was not a walk in the park, but that's a good thing, right? Like the tough difficulties meant to be tough. So the only way that I was able to actually overcome this was by using a kind of combination of techniques that I didn't use on Dawn. So I applied some elemental whetstones at the start of the fight to give the boss some ailments right off the bat. I also aggressively swapped between allies when they had openings, just again to keep up my DPS. I revived my allies as quickly as possible, obviously when they were downed. I was throwing objects from the arena at the boss as well. And then I mentioned that I cornered the boss on my Dawn version of this playthrough and I cornered him with all three characters here and then needed to make sure that while doing all of that stuff, I was hitting vital counter sparks to deal enough damage and just honestly to stay alive. Now, part of the staying alive process is making sure to remember to blade flash. That will obviously regenerate me my key. And that will then mean that it's a little bit easier to just stuff the boss's face with damage from all characters as much as possible, right? And so only with those things in combination was I able to get through this. And it just goes to show that there's a pretty stark difference in difficulty, right? But it's something that you can master and come out feeling really satisfied no matter what level you may be when you first start playing the game.